Myself and my boyfriend at the time were house-sitting for his uncle. My boyfriend was at work, and I was bathing our son before bed. I had the bathroom window, facing the backyard, very slightly cracked, and heard a cough from outside. This house was in a residential neighborhood, so it was probably just a neighbor, but I suddenly felt anxious and scared. Something told me to go make sure the back door was locked. I left my two-year-old son alone in a towel in the bathroom and walked to the back door. As I placed my hand on the doorknob locking it, I came face to face with someone through the glass who had his hand on the outside doorknob. He kept jiggling the doorknob, and I ran to my son and grabbed my cell phone to call for help. Remember, I'm house-sitting, and this was in 2004 or 2005 when they had those flip phones, not a smartphone where you can just look at a map. So I had no idea what the address was or where the house phone was. I call 911 from the bathroom on my cell phone while hearing loud pounding on the back door. The dispatchers tell me to find a house phone, piece of mail, or anything with an address. I locate the house phone and call 911 from that. I have no idea how the police got there so quickly, but just as I hear the back door glass break, the guy on the phone tells me to cover my son's head with a blanket and rush out the front door into the back seat of the police car. I ran out the front door and saw six or more police cars, all with guns drawn, and bolted straight into the waiting cruiser. After they arrested the guy, they asked me if the machete on the back porch belonged to the owners of the house. The guy had a machete with him. Had I not trusted my gut that the cough sounded a little too close and to check the back door, he would have walked right into an unlocked house where a 19-year-old female and her young son were sitting alone. Turns out he had been robbing houses, had a backpack full of stolen things, and was high on meth. Anyways, super glad I followed my gut on that one. Welcome back, everybody. Today we're going to be reading more true disturbing stories from the depths of the internet as well as from viewers. We've got a handful of strange ones this time around, so I think you guys will enjoy. Just as a heads up, I'd like to start compartmentalizing the different series we have on this channel. Um, obviously, we have the reading videos where we go through Reddit stories and the viewer submission stuff. Um, but we also have the icebergs, and then we have the fictional stories, and a couple others. So with that in mind, I'm looking for a good title for this series, because originally I just called them Reddit readings, but then we started including all the different viewer submissions, so I don't really know what to call it anymore. So if you guys have any ideas, leave them in the comments and let me know, because I really am kind of out of ideas. I was thinking something like campfire stories, and maybe I'd just always read them in front of a campfire or something, but I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of at a loss. So anyways, with all that out of the way, let's jump into our next story, which I honestly think is one of the weirdest ones I've heard in quite a while. Okay, folks, this happened when I was 14. I'm 29 as of the time of writing this. I'm not going to use this kid's real name, so I'll just call him Vinny. I come from a town where the people you went to high school with in kindergarten were the same kids you graduated with. Vinny moved to our school about halfway through the year. When new kids came to our school, everybody flocked to them. Vinny would always sit by himself during lunch. Something I found amusing about him was that he would get infuriated if people asked him if he skated. I took that as a challenge to try and piss him off, and it worked. The first time he and I had a class together, I remember the teacher asked him if he had his books yet. He responded with, No, sorry, my wife never confirmed my school schedule with the front office. I remember everybody thought that was funny. You're 14 years old, and you have a wife. He was clearly trying to get one over on the teacher. One day, my friends and I were skating after school, and we saw Vinny. I remember talking to my friends about what he said, and we all became oddly infatuated with this kid. After about a week of letting him hang out with us, he became one of the guys. One of my buddies asked if we could go sleep at his house on Friday night, 
under the guise that we took turns staying at each other's houses to skate, play video games, and smoke the green stuff. He looked perturbed, but the next day at school, he said it was okay after asking his parents. My buddies and I rode our bikes to where he lived with clothes for the night and our skateboards strapped to our bags. We met his family, who at face value seemed completely fine, but eventually things started to get a little weird. First, his dad had a huge weapons collection. At the time, I thought it was awesome. He even took us out into a field by a canal to shoot some of his assault rifles. Next, we met Vinny's wife. Yeah, the girl was real, and she was 26. While we lived in the southern United States, even this was taboo. At the time, we thought this was dope. It was like dating a senior when you're a freshman, only he was still in high school and she was paying taxes. Things kind of got to a new level of weird when Vinny's dad had his arm around Vinny's mom and his other arm around a girl that couldn't have been terribly older than we were at the time. Apparently, that was also his wife. We then spent about two hours praying with the family in the living room. I was raised Catholic, but couldn't determine which religion they were practicing. Once we finished with that, we went outside to start skateboarding. After a few minutes, his dad came outside and ordered us into the house. Vinny's mother then had us stand in line outside of the bathroom to take a bath. It still weirds me out, but I remember we weren't allowed to drain the water from the tub. I was the last one to bathe. Also, all of the mirrors in the house were covered with sheets. I don't know the significance of this. It makes more sense to me to not have mirrors at that point. We were told to go to bed even though the sun wasn't even down yet. Vinny went to bed with his wife and the three of us that remained just laid there in one single queen-sized bed and talked about how much fun we weren't having. The final straw for the night was having to hear Vinny's parents, and maybe the other woman, doing the dirty in the next room. It was almost 11pm when we decided to just get on our bikes and leave. It was dark, and we had to ride through some bad neighborhoods, but we made it safe to my buddy's house. Vinny's mother would also later call our parents and leave some cryptic messages, which implied trouble. Vinny was pulled from school maybe a week later, and we never saw him again. I don't know what that family was into. Maybe it wasn't creepy at all, and I just didn't understand. All I know is that we felt uncomfortable. I have no issues with religion, but if this was part of their practice, I think it's a little weird. Out of curiosity, I went to find Vinny on Facebook. All I can confirm is that he, his mother, father, and one of his sisters had died. There were no public records of what happened to them, or if they had died at the same time. Although there are obviously many different strange things about this story, I had a feeling that the whole covering the mirrors with blankets thing might be a clue as to what this family was practicing. After some light research, I found that many different religions actually believe that there's some connection between mirrors and death, and many have the belief that mirrors are a sort of portal to the spirit world. This is also a part of the Jewish practice of sitting Shiva, the week-long mourning period which occurs after a family member passes away. However, other than that, nothing else really points to this family being Jewish. This really seems like it was like a small-scale cult. I don't know, it's just very strange. In my late teens and early 20s, I was friends with a girl named Lucy. She was a very lonely kind of girl whose parents were, well, honestly, really shitty parents. Her mother was verbally abusive and her father really couldn't care less about anything. 
Because of the lack of love in her life, Lucy searched through dating sites for love and comfort from strange men, and she was not afraid of meeting them face to face, even if they'd been chatting for only a few days. My friendship with Lucy was a strange one. I found her quite annoying sometimes, but I also felt awful for her because of her loneliness and the lack of friends and love in her life. When it was just her and I together, she was normal and okay to be around, but also very appreciative of having someone giving her attention. We had a small group of friends, and she would try to get all of us together as often as possible, and honestly, the whole group together was really quite fun. When we were all together, Lucy was very hyper, and you could just tell that she was really happy to be around people who didn't insult her as her mother did. One day, out of the blue, Lucy tells us that she has a boyfriend. We were all surprised because we knew that she had met a lot of guys online, but we had never heard her say that she was actually dating someone. A few days later, she sets up a date for our friend group to meet Trevor. None of us were looking forward to it because we thought he was going to be like all the others, a temporary boy toy. When we met him, we all felt awkward. He barely spoke a word, he wouldn't look directly at any of us at all, and Lucy would try to be funny, but he would just give her dirty looks. We thought he was a weird one and could tell he didn't care much for her. As the days went on, Lucy kept telling me how much Trevor didn't like me. I thought this was a bit strange because I do my best to always be polite, respectful, and I smile a lot at everyone. But for some reason, he didn't like me. He kept saying things like, I'm using Lucy for her money. Not sure how he thought that since I pretty much pay for everything when it comes to Lucy. To keep this part of the story short, I think he was trying to find reasons to convince her to get rid of me. I just got a terrible vibe from Trevor. He didn't dress with much self-respect, he never smiled, he didn't shake our hands when we first met, he stank of weed, and really, I just had an overall uncomfortable feeling about him. After months of Trevor trying to convince Lucy that I'm a terrible friend and that she shouldn't hang out with me anymore, she started to do as he said. She started hiding me from him. If her and I were together and he would call her on her phone, she would lie and say I wasn't there. If the friend group was all together, he would have her swear that I wasn't there. When he was going to be joining the group in an outing or just hanging out at her place, she would tell me that I couldn't come. She was doing whatever he wanted just to keep him pleased, seemingly out of fear of losing him. Now, here's where it gets scary. Lucy calls me one day and says she wants me to come hang out at her place. I agreed. She came to pick me up and we went to her house and watched TV for a bit. We then decided since it's a nice day outside, we would take her two dogs for a walk to a nearby park and would later return to the house to have lunch together. While at this park, she receives a phone call. Now, Lucy is not a private person, and I have never seen her walk away to answer a phone call until this moment. She walked far enough away so that I wouldn't be able to hear what she was saying. This was a little weird to me, but nothing too strange to bring it to the forefront of my mind. The call ends and she begins walking towards me with a look on her face, as if she's trying not to smile. She tells me, Okay, I need to bring you home now. That confused me because we had only been together for about an hour, and we usually spent the entire day together. She would almost never ask me to go home, and would even frequently beg me to sleep over to avoid being alone. So anyway, I agreed, and we walked to drop her dogs off back at the house. After that, we got into her car, and off we went. About ten minutes into the car ride, I realized she isn't going in the direction of my house, so I asked her, where are we going? She smirked, but she didn't respond. I asked again, laughing uncomfortably, seriously, where are we going? She continued to smirk, but didn't want to answer me. 
I eventually realized that she was heading in the direction of where her boyfriend lived. Hell no. I asked one last time with anger in my voice, Where are you taking me? Her only response was bone-chilling to me. Trevor wants to talk to you. No, nope, I was having none of this. I insisted and demanded she let me out of the car, but with her evil smirk and same response, she said it again. It's okay, he just wants to talk to you. I was furious at this point because this creepy guy, who looks like he wants to kill someone, who also despised me, wanted to talk to me. Why can't he talk to me on the phone? Why do I need to go to his sketchy apartment? She absolutely refused to let me out of the car. She had the doors locked as if I wasn't able to unlock my passenger door. I waited until we reached a red light, grabbed her wallet from the back seat, took out her bus pass, and bolted out of the car. I had no idea where I was or where the nearest bus stop was, but I was not about to let her crazy-ass boyfriend do whatever he wanted to me. She yelled for me to get back in the car, but of course I ignored her. She sped off furiously. I immediately blocked her number on my phone, I removed her as my friend on social media, and immediately warned the group of friends not to talk to her because she's apparently gone nuts. I have not spoken to her since that very day, and she also lost the other five friends of the group as well. I, a 52-year-old female at the time, was traveling by car to an out-of-town job assignment. I had stopped at a popular and busy gas station slash travel stop. Okay, it was a Bucky's. To fill up the car, stretch my legs, use the restroom, and grab a snack. I was approached by a developmentally disabled woman who appeared to be in her mid-twenties. She was looking for a ride to a couple of towns over. Her ride had abandoned her while she was in the restroom. She was a little upset. She didn't have a cell phone and didn't know any of their phone numbers. I checked with the employees at the store and they said that she had been there for an hour looking for a ride. I then made the decision to do something I've never done before. Offer a stranger a ride. I wasn't going to the town she wanted to go to, but I was heading in that direction. I told her I could drop her off at the grocery store in the next town where I would be turning off to go to my destination. The grocery store was always busy, and it was very likely that she'd have an easier time getting a ride to where she wanted to go. Also, she'd be 5 miles away from the town instead of 25 miles, and she'd have an easier time walking that distance if she had to. This was agreeable to her, and we set off. Right away... I noticed a van following us. I tried to lose it, but it was keeping pace. Meanwhile, the woman wanted to play with my phone. I told her no, it wasn't a toy. It was for work, and I moved it out of her reach. The van then speeds up and starts to get closer. The woman suddenly remembers her boyfriend's phone number and says we need to call him. I couldn't use my phone while driving, as this was before you could sync your phone with your car. I was approaching the outskirts of the business district of the next town, and no cell phone use while driving signs were everywhere. I told her, we're almost to the grocery store, we can call him from the parking lot. She becomes agitated and yells, no, you have to take me home. I told you I can't do that. I'm not going there. It's in the opposite direction of where I need to go, and I'm expected soon. We'll call from the parking lot. She becomes more upset and frustrated, and the van is getting closer. I pull into the grocery store parking lot. It's about 4 p.m. The grocery store is busy. I pull up in front of the store and ask for her boyfriend's number. Apparently, she can't remember his number. She won't get out of the car, she's arguing with me, and the van is now pulling in behind us. 
There was a sheriff's deputy parked nearby, so I rolled down my window and signaled that I need to speak with him. He walks over and asks me what's going on. I explain the situation with the woman and that she won't get out of my car. Under my breath, I point out the van that has been following us. The deputy tells the woman, she brought you where you asked her to, it's time for you to leave the car. She slowly gets out of the car and I ask once more for her boyfriend's number, but she says, you're crazy, I don't have a boyfriend. Oh, look, there are my friends now. And she points to the damn van. The deputy and I share a look, and he says, Give me your contact info. I can delay them for about 20 minutes while I check their license and registration and lecture them about abandoning a special needs adult. You get out of here, and I'll check on you before my shift is over. And don't pick up any more hitchhikers. I left and went on to my destination. He called me to make sure I got to where I was going and told me that they were keeping an eye on the van and its owner. My nightmare is that one day I'll turn on a true crime show and see a report about this woman and her gang robbing and killing people. So with the knowledge of some of the other experiences I've heard from in the past, I believe this was 100% either an attempt at human trafficking or was supposed to be some kind of a robbery. Now, I don't think I've ever mentioned this before, but I actually had kind of a similar experience to this back when I was around 18. I was driving through a park with my girlfriend at the time, and after some time of driving around, we realized that this green SUV was following behind us. We were debating whether they were actually tailing us, so we started making a bunch of different turns, and they were still there. After doing that, like, a couple different times, we went down this one road where there was a roundabout, and I remember there was, like, this big party at the end, so I thought, okay, maybe they're going to this party, and we started turning around, and they followed us back around. After that, we just floored it and got out of the park, but I have no idea what their intentions were. It was probably nothing, but you just gotta be careful out there. You never know. My family and I had a mobile home in a holiday park in New South Wales. We would go there whenever school went on holiday, and there were many kids I used to run around and play with. I have fond memories of this place. It's where I learned to ride a bike and had my first kiss. But other memories are not as good, and now leave me with that egg flip feeling in my stomach. The people that owned the caravan park had a son. He was roughly 25 years old, and I would have been around 5 or 6. He would drive around the park and collect everyone's trash on a tractor, and do other odd jobs like that to help out his parents. Every once in a while, he would pull up when I was playing out front and ask if I wanted a ride on the tractor. I, being young and naive, of course accepted and jumped on because what child doesn't want to ride on a tractor? This was back in the days where parents would let their children play in the streets without much supervision, and you just had to be back home when the streetlights came on. One day, when he dropped me back to our van, my dad came storming out, grabbed me by the arm, and yanked me off the tractor. Without saying a word to the man, he took me inside and told me to never, ever hang out with him again. But he's nice, he gave me lollies, I say. Just don't. I'm telling you, don't talk to him, he replied. I couldn't understand why my dad didn't want me talking to the nice man who gave me tractor rides, lollies, hugs, and sometimes the occasional sandwich. I remember telling the man one day, My dad said I'm not allowed to talk to you anymore. To which he smirked and replied, Oh yeah? Why is that? Fast forward nearly 14 years later, my family and I are watching the news when the man's face flashes across the screen attached to a story explaining that he had killed two people and is now serving time in prison. My dad said, Look at this, look at this. I knew he was bad news. There was always something about him. Do you remember when he used to take you around on the tractor? My blood ran cold and my stomach dropped. The most disturbing part? 
he killed people with pills he would call his lollies. Growing up, my mom had recurring nightmares as a child that were the same every single time. She was a social worker in presumably the 1930s, where she has to check in on an orphanage. In the dream, she walks up a long staircase past the second floor and up to the large attic. Before entering, there was a stained glass window at the top of the stairs before she walked in. When she walks inside, she sees orphans on cots who seem malnourished and are asking her to help them. She panics and starts writing down the living conditions within the home and tells the kids she will help them get out of there. Shortly after, the woman who runs the orphanage appears at the stairs and threatens her to not report the orphanage and get it shut down. My mom refuses and says that she's going to anyways. But before she gets the chance to leave, the owner of the orphanage yells at her, calls her a pig, and pushes her down the stairs. The dream ends right there every time, and she wakes up. This continued throughout her childhood, but stopped as she got older. Flash forward to my mom in her early 20s, she and my dad had just gotten married and were visiting a friend, who I'll call Mary. She had also been recently married and bought a house with her husband, and decided to throw a housewarming party. It was in the historic downtown area of our city, and my mom noted how she immediately felt weird stepping foot in the house. As Mary gave my parents the house tour and took them upstairs, my mom started to feel uneasy, but she couldn't place why. As the tour continued, Mary took them to the top floor. As they approached the top, my mom's heart dropped to her stomach. At the top of the stairs, there was the same exact stained glass window from her childhood nightmares. She started to have a legitimate anxiety attack as Mary explained how they would renovate the attic into an extra room. Mary stepped inside the attic and showed my parents the cots tucked away in the corner. She explained how the house was a rundown orphanage in the early 1900s and the cots remained in the attic for decades. Now, at this point, my mom is hyperventilating and told my dad she needed to go outside for some air. For context, my mom used to smoke, and so she reached for a cigarette she had tucked behind her ear, and she shakily walked down the stairs. My dad followed behind her, extremely confused, and blurted out, I don't like when you have the cigarette behind your ear. It makes you look like a pig. That sent her over the edge, and she tripped and fell the rest of the way down the stairs. She made it outside, utterly panicked, and explained to my dad the reoccurring childhood nightmare. He felt horrible and profusely apologized for calling her a pig. He had no idea why that was even the first thing that came to mind. Needless to say, they never stepped foot in that house again. Anyways, that's all we've got for today. I know I haven't been making too many of these narration videos recently, so I kind of want to start getting back into the swing of it. With that being said, if you have any strange, disturbing, or unexplainable experiences of your own, be sure to submit them using the link in the description.